Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have my good friend and colleague here, Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? What's up, Tom? Just uh, enjoying a rainy day, getting ready for the Masters, checking out some uh, high rates of inflation from uh, economic data. A lot happening on Wednesday. A lot happening. Well, we'll land on the Masters and some predictions, but let's uh, let's jump into the pod today. So we have uh, we've had a bunch of questions. Um, We picked out six that we've been getting uh, quite a few on. So we're going to go through them one by one. Um, And then we'll do some predictions at the end. So let's start with the first one. It's time to hear from listeners as we open the mailbag and answer your questions. Uh, Yield curve inversions. What does it mean? Why does it matter? Where are we now? Yeah, Tom. So there's really two yield curve inversions that people look at. One is when the U.S. Treasury two-year uh, is uh, higher than the 10-year. The other one is when the U.S. Treasury three-month bill is higher than the 10-year. Uh, usually, people look at these, and the reason why is it's a great indicator of recession. It also means that it's going to be interesting times in interest markets because typically you'd expect you let somebody borrow money for longer. They're going to pay you a higher rate of interest, but instead it's inverted where you have to borrow money for two years. It's more expensive than if you wanted to borrow for 30. Uh, now, the reason to bring it up today and the reason I think we're getting a lot of questions is about a year and a half ago, there was a ton of news articles, TV, letting everybody know the yield curve had inverted. So it's been about 460, 470 days since that happened. And we haven't had an official recession. We've had a lot of economic weakness, um, but yield curve inversions are just what they sound like. It's when this usual shape like that goes like this and it doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, you have everything from 30-day bonds to 30-year and everything in between, and a typical yield curve slight goes up the longer the longer the term is. You know, if you're going to lend someone your money, you want to be compensated for the longer that money is held up. So you have this naturally sloping curve up, and it's, it's almost completely backwards. It's actually pretty flat right now, and some parts it's inverted depending on what durations you're looking at, but you're right. Typically, a recession has followed after every one, and this is the longest streak. So we'll see if they can pull off this uh, this soft landing or not, if we go into a recession, which I think you predicted we were already in one a couple pods Yeah, I, I think that the, the challenge is that we've changed the definition of recession. So we had a four or five month period where economic data was very weak. And if you look at revisions on payrolls, they were pretty bad as well. Um, but if you decide that it's two quarters of ne- economic growth like it used to be, we're not going to be quite there because it'll be a month or two short. If you say like in COVID, uh, March 2020, they had the shortest recession of all time. Uh, it didn't even have those two quarters, but it's declared official. You know, the National Bureau of Economic Research that declares that, you know, they change the definition. So it's hard to say exactly what a recession is compared to the past. But I think when you have a yield curve inversion, it messes with banks a lot, right? Because the propensity to lend long and borrow short gets reversed. So really, in an advanced economy, a lot of economic growth depends on loan growth. And that loan growth is going to be stopped pretty suddenly if they can't borrow short for cheaper than they can lend long. Uh, it long gets long, inverted. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense for them anymore, right? You know, I, I think this is kind of an anomaly, though. I think one of the reasons, the biggest reason the yield curve is so inverted is because of how quickly they move rates. And that's mm-hmm. ne- they never moved that quick before so this could be the one time where we don't see it but uh like you said it won't be declared until months and months if not quarters after we're already through the recession yeah so in summary yield curve inversion is exactly what it sounds like it's when short rates are yielding a higher interest rate than long rates uh, and it's typically a sign that economic activity is going to decline yep all right right. number two i'll ask you tom you can you can kick us off on this one so we get a lot of questions about credit spreads, and usually it's in time of economic stress that you hear about them, you see them in the newspaper, you hear about them on TV. Um, what is a credit spread? <laughs> right now, so, are they tight or are they wide? And what is the so, impact and why do they 
Yeah. So the, in, in the simplest version, a credit spread is what the spread, it, it, it's in terms of bonds, um, what the yield is on a bond and how much that bond is yielding over the risk-free rate of return, which are treasuries. Government debt is risk-free. Um, some would argue the opposite, but they're considered risk-free. And if you have a corporate bond like Bank of America, say, they're going to have a spread over that comparable treasury. Um, and that's what a credit spread is. So the wider that spread is, you'll see bigger cracks in the economy because you're being compensated more in yield to for a potential default risk or uh, a potential recession. So credit spreads start to widen um, when you see cracks in the economy. And typically when they when you see credit spreads, especially in the high yield market, which are, which are junk bonds, um, bonds below triple B or, or, or lower, um, when they wind into a certain point, that's usually the first first red flag, but they're really tight right now. They've, they've actually, they're the tightest they've been um, in, a lot, in, a, in a long time. So that's all good news. That's why there's a lot of, I'll tell you, you look at all these indicators in the economy and it's a mixed bag right now. Yield curve inversion saying recession, credit, credit spreads are saying the exact opposite right now. Yeah, so Tom, along those lines, what are typical credit spreads between let's say treasuries and investment grade bonds versus high yield bonds. And then you know, we'll typically, get into the municipal side after that. Typically you see, you know, four, three, four hundred basis points in the on the high yield market over over comparable treasuries. Um, the higher you go up in the corporate st structure, you know, single A, double A, triple A, those spreads get tighter and tighter. Um, but they're the tightest they've been in a long time. So some would say you're not really being compensated enough to take on the default risk of corporate debt versus just investing in in treasuries which is what we're seeing when you got money markets at five and treasury bonds you know the four years at four and a half percent today um, so tom it sounds so, like you don't want to own high yield right now because the spread's not big enough when does it make sense to own high yield how big of a spread do you want to see you know it, it it's uh it's a blessing and a curse because they get wide enough they look attractive but if they get too wide they could go even wider and you start losing value on those bonds as a, as those credit spreads start to widen and if there's and if it's calling for a recession you know it could be it could be ugly for the the the, the bond market but i would say five six hundred basis points above comparable treasuries is a good time to own those type of credit spreads what about internationally? So the EU has a ton of different countries into it, uh, but they have this monetary union where the European Central Bank is over all of them. Why is it that Germany and France have relatively low yields, while some of the other countries that maybe aren't so attractive as far as paying their debts, like Italy or Greece, uh, if they all under the same central bank, why is there spreads and how, how is that information useful? Yeah, I mean, they're all under the same central bank, but they still have... Uh, their own default risk as a country. Um, and in return, they're going to have higher yields to compensate you for taking on that additional risk, just like just like corporate debt. Um, you don't want to invest in a, in, a, in, a, in a sovereign debt that's yielded 14% because it's probably a good sign that the economy is not doing well over there. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that's credit spreads. It's um, taking a risk-free rate like the U.S. Treasury and comparing it to other taxable bonds, whether they be corporate or high yield. Thank you, Tom. All right. All right, let's go to number three, impact of immigration on housing, GDP, et cetera. I know you had mentioned something about fertility rates earlier on. What's, uh, what are your thoughts there? All right, so I can divide this into two different parts. Uh, one is just gonna be the impact of immigration and two is gonna be the impact of fertility rates, but this all falls under the umbrella of demographics. So. Some economists will tell you demographics are destiny. Uh, others will say, well, it's a big factor, but it's not the only factor. So the impact of immigration on housing is multiple. So if we're building a lot of houses here in the United States uh, and let's say family formations, so you get married like Tom recently did, you start to have a few kids like I've got three, you need a lot more housing. Uh, and if those family formations happen quickly, you need that. Well, you can kind of plan for that because we know when these kids are born, <laughs> we register them, they get social security numbers. We have a pretty good idea. We do a census every 10 years of what population is growing. Uh, the second part is immigration. So what, what if we're adding a bunch of people? What kind of stress is that? So if there's more people going after less houses, that means housing prices are gonna go up. Uh, and we've seen this to the worst effect as far as Canada goes. So Canada for the last probably 10 years has had massive immigration. And now Toronto 
and Vancouver are some of the most expensive housing markets in the world. Uh, as far as GDP growth, it's really driven by two things. One is population size. So how many people? So one of the reasons the baby boomers uh, saw so much growth is there were just so many of them. They were all buying houses. They were all buying cars. They're all buying college educations, groceries, gone on vacation. They were the biggest market as far as demographics in the United States. Now that generation that's after them, we'll call them the millennials, is not as big as them. Will they pick up the slack as far as the employment sector? Will they pick it up in the workforce as far as the number of people? And if they don't, how do they overcome that? Well, the way they can overcome it is one, through immigration. So we're just adding new people to replace the boomers that we're losing, or you can get it through productivity growth. So I think that demographics are destiny as far as here's your baseline, here's where you're going, uh, but productivity and a lot of other things can have an impact. What are your takes on GDP, immigration, demographics, and that part? You know, there's uh, there's definitely a housing shortage right now in, in the U.S., which is why housing prices, even with the high interest rates, haven't come down. In fact, in most cities, they're 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 still going up. You have the lock-in effect of people not trading in, trading in in uh, uh, their low mortgages for higher mortgages. But another big piece is the millions of immigrants that are coming here illegally, and what you're seeing is you're seeing the rent market take off because of it. They're not going to go out and buy houses, but what they are going to do is they're going to compete with rent and and they need a place to live. So I think that's going to have a huge impact. Um, we're not, the, there's a there's a supply crisis. It's only going to get worse. It stemmed from COVID, um, which then came from higher interest rates. So builders, it, cost, it was more cost prohibitive to build, to get supplies. Um, so if you have more people looking for the same amount of houses, like you said, it's going to continue to increase rent and, and houses at the same time. Yeah. I think that that's a pretty good take. The, the other side of this, Tom, is the fertility question. So in the world globally, the global fertility rate, so the total number of births per woman, has roughly halved in the past 50 years down to 2.3. Now, uh, demographers, economists will tell you you need 2.1 births per woman in order to replace the population because some people don't have kids, some people die early, things like that. So it's not just a two-for-two two situation. You have to have a little bit more than that. Uh, and that's been dropping considerably. So we, we mentioned the United States just in the first part of this and how that has the impact. But globally, if there's a lot less people, uh, <laughs> those, those are pretty magnified. Now, every country is aware of this, especially the developed ones. And so I want to point out a couple of things. First, we're going to go to South Korea, which arguably has the worst of the places. Uh, their birth rate is going to fall to 0.68 this year, and they're getting to extremes. So there's a South Korean construction group called Boo Young, who is offering workers a $75,000 bonus for each baby they produce. Now, Tom, this isn't a tax break. This isn't a political leader saying, hey, maybe we'll pass this policy. This is a company going, we really need you to have a kid. Please go have one and offering you a $75,000 bonus. So I'll, ha I'll pause there and go, Tom, you're going to have this <laughs> kid this year if Global Wealth offers you a $75,000 bonus? Well, if we can if we can hand out contracts early on and get these kids as employees, then yeah, let's let's start them while they're young. I mean, it, what's I don't understand the benefit of uh, <laughs> of employers of companies paying bonuses to have kids if there's no direct benefit to that company. Yeah, Just, so I think it's a it's a countrywide problem. It's a worldwide problem. Uh, you know, some of the comments in the article from South Korea. One woman from Seoul says that she would say that you know if I have a kid, my life's going to be reduced to nannying and housework and told her her mother, uh, who really wants her to have a kid, if you give me $200,000 off a baby. So uh, apparently there's not enough money. Um, now, follow on that to somewhere a little more familiar is um, the United States as well as Western Europe. There are countries that have put a lot of things in place to help. So one of the things the Trump administration did was expand the child tax care credit. They made it refundable. There's a lot of reasons why having more kids, they were going to make it more palatable as far as the cost goes. But what they found is that these policies don't really work. So in the US, in the UK, and other developed markets, uh, they just don't seem to work. So they call it a baby bonus. So whether they give you parental leave for six months, uh, they've still seen birth rates decline from 1.85 to 1.53 over the last 40 years. So this is a problem that's not just in the US, not just in industrial, it's globally, um, but it's, it's cratering. Uh, and Korea's, you know, 0.7-ish. <laughs> uh, the U.S. is still okay. Uh, in the U.S., you know, we have an attractive market, so we do have that immigration kind of replacing a lot of the people who are not creating. Uh, but globally, if this falls below, we're going to have a shrinking global population. And 
the impact of that is going to be profound. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, some of our partners about uh, that seventy-five thousand dollars bonus for you. We'll see. Yeah. Can all... Yeah. All right. Um, uh, go ahead. I'll, you, you take the next one or ask the next one. All right. So uh, I'll ask the next one. Uh, expat life. Uh, we do get a lot of questions on this. You see it a lot on social media. Could I really move abroad in retirement? Is it cheaper? What are the major pitfalls, pros and cons? What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, the answer is you can definitely do it. It's very much available to you. Um, at one point, I think Costa Rica received the most Social Security checks that went outside the United States because so many people about 20 years had relocated to live there. Uh, now, the things you want to look for is the healthcare system. That's chief number one. If you're in your 60s or 70s, the reality is you're going to go to the doctor a little more often. And so, you know, if you want to go to France, if you want to go to London, if you want to go to Costa Rica or you're you know, anywhere abroad, you want to review, do I have access to health care? How much is it going to cost me? The second one would be, uh, is it cheaper? So one of the reasons people might choose to leave the United States is that the cost of living abroad might be considerably lower. I know that many immigrants from Mexico and other parts of Latin America, they come here, work for 20, 25 years, and then they move back because the money that they earned here and they could save, they can live on for a long time. I had a professor from India in college, and he said it's like less than a sixth for him to move back. And he could have a house with a couple of people who work in it, uh, like domestic employees, for the lifestyle that he was leading in the United States. So as far as cost, it can be considerably cheaper. Uh, now, major pitfalls. Uh, I think the number one major pitfall is that people just end up missing their social network that they built over their lifetime. So whether that's kids, cousins, family, or just people in the community, uh, that tends to be the reason people move back the most, uh, besides you know an incident like healthcare or crime happening to them. But I think the key to selecting is you got to find somewhere where you're a cultural fit. So if you don't speak Spanish, moving to a country that <laughs> the primary language is Spanish may not be the best choice. You might want to learn some Spanish or learn some Italian or learn some Greek if you're going to go over there. Uh, but there's a lot of successful people who are dual lingual and go, all right, I live here and there, and I go back and forth, and it, it's a nice thing. And it's not just here. Uh, they do it in Europe as well. They do it in other countries where people are leaving London to go to Spain, uh, and they decided, well, I won't go to Miami because it's too expensive, so I'll go to Spain because I'm from Argentina. So the world is open. You can go anywhere you want. Uh, I would just reemphasize healthcare costs generally uh, and then cultural heritage, I'll call it, as well as you're just going to miss the people that you love. Tom, what do you have to add on that one? You know, the only one, the only thing I would add, I agree with all that, is 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 the military. If we go to World War Three, where do you want to be? Who do you want fighting for you? <laughs> um, sorry to be so cynical, but it's just uh, it's a crazy, crazy place. But no, but it, it everything that's going on internationally. I think you know you mentioned crime and that kind of you know uh, tales on that, but. Um, no, I think you can do whatever you want. Puerto Rico had some some major tax incentives for a while. I don't know if that's still the case, mm -hmm. um, but there's places abroad where you're not really abroad. Um, you're still close to home, culturally, you speak the language, um, all that. So I agree with you. Yeah, the other piece I'd say on there is people living in a big city that's a high cost of living, moving to a place that's less cost of living. So a lot of people moving to the south, or people who move away from big cities to places where there's big colleges. So they have all the services, but don't have all the hustle and bustle and the costs associated just within the United States. That's common too. So if you choose to make some of these moves, you're not alone, uh, but keep, keep the reality in mind. You need to speak Spanish to live in a Spanish speaking country. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tom, uh, our next question is about the stock market and I get a ton of these. Um, you know, from we talked about last episode, what makes a good stock, that type of thing. But uh, people always want to know what drives the stock market. Why does it seemingly go up so often? So we joke it always goes up except when it goes down. Uh, but what really drives the stock market? Is it corporate earnings? Is it the Federal Reserve? Is it something else? No, it's it's 100 percent earnings and valuations. That's at the end of the day. That's what drives the stock market. Um, you're going to have, you know, times and waves where the Fed, um, you know, 2022 with the increase in rates helped drive the stock market down for sure. But they're just blimps in times. At the end of the day, it's about company earnings. We're about to go through earnings season right now. And if earnings are good, even if the Fed doesn't cut or even worse, if they decide that they may hike after the numbers that we saw today, which I don't think is on the table. Yeah, they could they could cause the the headline risk and 
You'll see the sell-offs, but at the end of the day, why the stock market works is because of company earnings and valuation. So I think it's very, very dependent upon that. Um, and I think if you, we go through another good earnings season, like we saw in the first quarter, um, then we should we should have another good, good couple quarters ahead of us. Yeah, as a follow-up on that, Tom, um, interest rates being high or low, kind of driven by the Fed, not necessarily always set by the Fed. Uh, does that have an impact on stock market? I mean, is it low rates better, high rates better? Does it matter? Does it matter a certain type of stock? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. I mean, you know, the companies that are that are highly levered and use debt, so small cap companies or tech companies, um, which is why tech stocks got hit so bad in 22 with the high interest rates. At the end of the day, um, every company, big and small, needs to grow. They, one of the tools they use is issuing debt. And when you have, that can be a big line expense item on your P&L. And if interest rates continue to go up, it's going to be harder for some of these companies to be profitable. So there is an indirect relationship with, with the Fed and interest rates because um, eventually they will, they will affect earnings. Um, but I don't think it's the high rates, it's the velocity and, and how long they stay up there. Um, that will really affect, and that's what we've been. That's what we've been waiting for is for these earnings and these high interest rates to finally affect these companies' earnings. And you're just not really seeing it as much as we would have thought. You mentioned on the front end, the banks. You know, they borrow short and lend long. Um, banks are still profitable right now. JP, JP, uh, I think earnings is coming out this Friday. They're the first bank to announce, and we'll see what they have to say. But um, it, that's the big question right now: is how. Can, how much longer can this economy weather these higher interest rates, which, by the way, looking back over the last hundred years, they're not really abnormally high. So as far as short term versus long term in the short term, obviously, day to day, you know, a company reports earnings is going to be a big move. It's kind of a catalyst day. But in the short term or the long term, are earnings more important or interest rates movements more important? Like, for example, people talk about if the Fed raised rates in 2022, all these stocks fell because there were higher rates. And if they cut rates ahead of the election, you know, the stock market rally, is that just noise or is there a signal to follow there? No, I think they're I think short term, they both work in tangent. I mean, and you're seeing that today with, with, the, with the inflation data that came out um, a little bit hotter than, than expected in the market selling off. And you'll see that individual stock prices, a company misses or beats or gives bad forward guidance. Um, the company will either go up or go down real, uh, at that day. So I think short term, they both have a lot of headline and, and media risk. And there's a lot of technical traders in this market. There's more people trading in this market, the algorithms, um, the technology. So it's money's quick. And uh, those 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 headlines that come out move the market for sure. But I think longer term earnings have a more impactful move for the market than than the Fed. All right. So thanks, Tom. Uh, our last question is about a topic that seems to be everywhere, uh, and that's the topic of private equity. So we get questions from clients sometimes. I, do I need to own private equity? Or they come in and say, I want to own private equity. What alternatives do you have available? How do I go about buying that? Um, Tom, you want to comment on different private equity funds, maybe the impact of rates on private equity? And, you know, more commonly, every kid in their 20s seems to want to work in private equity. Uh, is that is that meaningful? Is that is some signal? What, what are we missing? Did we choose the wrong career path? No, I mean, 20 years ago, it was everyone was, uh, what do you do? I work in IB, which stands for investment banking. And now it's everyone wants to work for private equity. I think I think it's there's an there's an alternative asset class to just traditional stocks and bonds. And it's private equity, it's venture capital, it's private credit, um, private real estate. It's all these things in the market that don't have a lot of liquidity. So there's a place for it. Um, everyone's situational, but I do think there's a place for alternatives and in particular private equity. When you look at these companies, 30 years ago, companies just IPO'd and then the growth happened. Now they grow through private equity, venture capital, and then they decide to IPO, but the growth's already been established. So you need, if you want to get in early on some of these companies, unless you're going to go fund them yourselves, which none of us on this, on this podcast are probably doing, you know, you look for some of these private type or alternative type of investments that that own their one private equity shop or own a bunch or own a, a combination that they can go in and get access to companies early in their, their growth stage. So I think I think private equity is it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere, obviously. And there's more it's more accessible now than it ever was before. 
15 years ago, you'd have had millions and millions of dollars to go to some kind of private equity shop as far as an investment or a hedge fund. Um, and now it's more readily available to the average investor. And I think it's something that we constantly take a look at for our clients and I think should should be on the radar. So let's talk about the different types of private equity. So uh, within that world, there's a lot there, right? So you could have a partnership like a Blackstone or a Carlisle Group where you invest in one of their funds. You could have a direct business that you own a piece of, whether it's startup capital or whether it's, uh, you know, you participate in a deal where they're buying out a company to do a roll up. Do you have some comments about some of the pros and cons or the types of private equity within that kind of sphere? Because when you just label it private equity, I mean, it's a really complicated pie underneath. No, it's it's probably too it's probably too long for this podcast, and I think we should probably do a follow up one on the different types of private equity. But you're right, there's private equity is so broad now that there's a, a million different ways to get access to it. There's mergers and arbitrage. Um, there's uh, private credit. Um, there's I mean there's 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 real estate. There's tech startups. I mean there's so many different avenues you can go. Um, I don't think one's better than the other. They all have their pros and cons. Some some lock you in longer than others. Some pay you a distribution while you wait. Some are more aggressive. Some are more conservative. So it's a, it's a very broad category, and it's just getting broader, in my opinion. All right. So we'll do a deeper dive on a future episode and go through startup capital versus venture capital versus, uh, we'll call it roll-ups and all the other different things you could be doing. So to conclude, Tom, do you have any bold predictions for the Masters? I know you kind of mentioned that at the beginning. And I, I'm on a hot streak. I got Scotty Scheffler two years ago. I told you it was going to be John Rahm last year. I'm having trouble with this year because uh, the odds are all over the place. But who you got? What are your bold predictions? Tiger going to make the cut? Yeah. I, so I was just going to say, my only, you know, I'm rooting for, rooting for Scotty. I was just at the Houston Open. Um, he was the only one that I even recognized as far as names. Um, it was a very uneventful way to have him come through that par three and just to just the part it was uh was not was not super exciting but you got a root for scotty <laughs> texas guy um but yeah. i think tiger it'd be nice to see tiger make make a run at it but i don't think he's got a shot at making the cut although his yeah, swing i, I did it looks good <laughs> i don't I know if he can walk the course for four rounds <laughs> i don't think he can either um I hope he does. I really, it'd be real exciting if he's in it on sunday I think yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a better chance of a, a no name winning the Masters um, than Tiger making the cut. So I'll give you a name, Tom. So we talked about Scotty Shell. We talked about John Rahm. Those are the two lowest odds, best chances to win. I'd feel silly taking a repeat of my previous year. So I'm going to go a little different. Which this is not the longest of shots, but it's a long shot, and he's a Dallas guy. Will Zalatoris. Look for him to be in one of those final groups on Sunday. And if he gets that putter hot, I, I think it's his tournament to win. So we'll see if I can so, go three years in a row. The odds are pretty strong against me on that. So I, I think they're making a happy Gilmore too. Um, I don't know if that's a rumor <laughs> or if that's, but oh, he's he, gonna he he's it? gonna play the, he's gonna play the caddy. I mean, you you've seen the the memes and the, yes, the posts. I mean, those two look identical. Um, but I don't know if they're actually coming out with uh, Gilmore too. But I saw something that he's gonna he's gonna be in it. That would be great. He is aware that he looks like the caddy. And I, I saw him live at Colonial one year. And, I mean, he, he's six foot some change. But, I mean, if he turns sideways, you barely see him. So it's amazing how far a guy that small or that thin or slight can hit the ball because it is incredible to watch him spin around and go that far. So I'm excited for the weekend and excited to see him hopefully win and keep my streak of Masters predictions alive. All techniques. Well, I love it. Well, we'll follow up on the next pod with alternatives. I think that should be a good one. And we can talk about private equity and all the different other alternative investments that are out there. All right. Talk to you then, Tom. Bye. All right. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to your Money Momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to GWAdvisors.net. Thanks. And we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.